tell me, Lorimer, what's pain? What is it? It's a great question. I mean, we all have it, don't we? Well, nearly everyone has it, and if you don't have it, you're... In trouble. You really are in trouble, yeah, and, and you're likely to die before you should. Uh, but I, the way that I think about pain, and I think is, is the most sensible way to think about pain, is that it is the most sophisticated device that we have to protect our body. Uh, and it's, it is so sophisticated the, because it's an output of the brain, and that's, I reckon that's the key... The key thing that has been lost since probably the 50s, uh, where we discovered these special receptors and nerves in your body that respond to dangerous things. And when we discovered, or when, when they discovered that, uh, there was a almost a slip of the tongue where they started to call these things pain fibres and pain receptors, which they're not. They're danger receptors. But that slip of the tongue meant that that's become part of the way that we think now and that we think, okay, well, we've got receptors for pain, which we don't have. We have receptors for danger. Pain well, is what's something... What's the difference? Well, pain is something that you need your brain to have. Danger can happen. You can chop off your head, not something that I would recommend, obviously, but you can chop off your head and your tissues of your body can still be in danger. And we will still have receptors that are excited by that and send a message to the brain which effectively says danger in your leg or danger in your back but your brain really has to ask the question how, how dangerous is this really based on everything i know everything that i know even the things that i know that i don't even know that i know you sound like that american don't you <laughs> that said the things we know that we don't know that we know yeah yeah well i mean the, the brain stores all this stuff and will produce pain if if the brain thinks that you need protecting so does your brain and my brain work exactly the same in this regard uh, no. In fact, my brain doesn't work the same now as it does now uh, because we're always... I mean, the brain is is such a magnificent organ. It's always changing. So if, if you and I both had a thumb tack put into our thumb and we were in a brain scanner, your brain would do something slightly different to mine. Uh, and everyone's would do something slightly different. But they'd generally be in a in a magnus, magnum sort of way. They'd all be saying danger because you've got a thumbtack through your thumb. Yeah, if, if you and I both experience pain when we put the thumbtack in, which we probably would in an experimental setting, that mix of activity in the brain, all over the brain, uh, a particular mix of activity is... For you, for you, the thing that produces pain into consciousness. Well, then, what is it possible to do something that should produce pain that, but that doesn't because the brain is work works differently? It, mm. I'm, trying to, I'm yeah, putting yeah. this in a very ham-fisted way, but it, but do some people, well, do some people's brains perceive danger differently from other people's? That's a great question. Um, can I paraphrase the question? So if I say, can, does the brain of someone respond differently to danger? Like someone might produce yes. pain and someone else might produce something else. Is that what That's what I mean, yeah. So, yes. Yeah, I think that, that can happen. We have other protective consciousnesses, like we have fear. That's a very effective protective device. That we, we feel afraid, we want to run away. Mm. The thing that is probably characteristic of pain is that it's about a, a particular part of your body. So included in the networks in your brain that produce pain, there is a, a reference to a part of your body. Ah, now this is where the violinist comes in, isn't it? If the violinist hurts the finger, the violinist is going to feel that pain as a, as a very threatening thing because it's going to threaten the ability to play the violin. Is that, is that what we're saying? You're great. You've, you've well, done I've been research, No, I've been you? reading your book, you see. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so we did a study where we compared pain threshold for the little finger on the hand of violinist that works the strings versus the hand that works the bow. And there was lots of data in that study, but the important thing was that the little finger on your left hand of a violinist hurts more easily. It's easier to make it pain, painful than is the other finger. And the, the best way of us interpreting that is, is you think of how dangerous it is for a violinist, a professional violinist, to lose their left little finger. Yes. They lose everything. They lose their identity, they lose their income, they lose their favourite thing because they can't play anymore. But if they lose their right little finger... They can still play the violin and it just feels odd to shake hands or yeah. something like that. If you were running away from a ferocious dog, 
that was chasing you and you fell over and grazed your knee and picked yourself up again and kept running until you got through the gate and locked the, ga- the dog out, are you saying that you might not feel the pain of the graze on your knee as much as you would if you were just running along one day, fell over and grazed your knee? Ow, yeah. I've really hurt my knee. Absolutely. Perfect example. And I guess the thing that I, I'm really pedantic about and the bee in my bonnet when I talk about this to clinicians and to patients who, who experience a lot of pain is that when you fall over and graze your knee and you get up and you're escaping from the dog in that scenario... Your knee is damaged, you have danger messages coming from your knee into your spinal cord, up your spinal cord, into your brain, but you, you don't have knee pain until you have knee pain. Until you've and safely disposed safely, of the dog. Once the knee hurts, that's the instant that you have knee pain. Pain doesn't exist until then. That's really important, isn't it? That's it's, really yeah, important. It's I mean, it's a, it's a subtle thing. It sounds like duh. But it actually is very subtle. You don't have knee pain until you have knee pain. Mm. So the pain isn't an, an entity that exists until... Now, you're also fussy about the use of the word perception of pain, aren't you? Are you saying the yeah. experience of pain or what? Until your brain uh, knows I, that it's pain or what? No, I think you, you, you're very good on your research to know that I'm fussy about that phrase. Uh, I think that that phrase, although it, it, it's strictly correct... It implies to the person hearing it, if we say something to someone like, uh, "Well, you know, your perception of pain is that it, of this pain is that it's really bad," mm. right? and that may be true, but what someone will hear is that the pain is this fixed amount, this entity, which you've you know you've described is not true, but they will hear, okay, it's this entity, and your perception of it is that it's worse than it is, and that's that's false. Mm. the The accurate thing to say would be, "Your pain is really bad, isn't it?" Yes. Not your perception of pain, because that, to me, that implies that we think that there's a problem with their, their, they're perceiving something that's not true. So then know. we get into this business of pain thresholds, don't we? Yeah. Do you have any comment about? Do you have any understanding or belief or views on the fact that the same injury might bother somebody really badly compared? Or no, injury is different. Let's say post-operative yep. orthopedic pain, yep. which can be really, really, you know, people yep. can report having great episodes of pain after they've had knee surgery or shoulder surgery or something, yep. that one person in one bed might be experiencing at a certain level and be requiring a lot of morphine, for instance. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The person in the next bed might not. My automatic assumption from observing those two people would be, well, that person's got a higher pain threshold than the other one. What do you say about that? Uh, I, pain threshold is is extremely specific to the cause of the pain. So we could we could really simplify that and say, let's take you and I, and we'll put us into a, a particular experimental laboratory, and we'll give a forty three degree stimulus, and everything is controlled for, yeah? Mm-hmm. And you and I will probably rate the pain that that evokes pretty similarly. And we'll, ha- we'll both have pain at about 42 degrees. Even if we both have different attitudes to pain, even if you fear pain more than I do? No. So that's where we, they're the things we can't control even in a laboratory setting. But in a laboratory setting, we control everything else. We can't control your life and mm. your brain and mm. compared to mine uh, and the experience that we have. Uh, you, you know that you're uh, in the community of pain researchers when you can't experiment on yourself because it doesn't hurt enough. So I've got several burns now because I I test out stimuli and it doesn't hurt enough because my brain has to evaluate how dangerous it is and my brain now has the experience of, well, we've been here before. This is not mm. this is not dangerous. Even though the messages coming from my hand will be the same as, as yours, for example. But if you take back to the orthopaedic example, we go out of the laboratory setting and we're in the real world where we have all sorts of complexities that the brain evaluates.